Today we have a great speaker and it's my privilege to uh, invite our speaker, Professor uh, Shevbrat Singh from uh, Indian, Institute of, Indian Institute of Technology, currently uh, acting as the head of the Metallurgical Engineering Department, as well as the chairman of Steel Technology Center at IIT Karakpur, India. He completed his PhD in Metallurgical Engineering from the University of Cambridge in 1998. His research interests are in physical metallurgy, phase transformation, and thermomechanical processing of steels. Today, Professor Singh is going to present a talk uh, on some interesting aspects of displacive transformations in steel. Professor Singh, thank you very much for your time, and please proceed with your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Prakash, for your kind introduction. So, uh, as you said, I will be speaking about some interesting aspects of displacive transformations in the steels. So, so let us start straight away. And we have all seen this, right? The, the lattice correspondence between FCC and body center tetragonal structure. What I would like to draw your attention to is the octahedral voids that exist in FCC lattice. There are three octahedral voids per iron atom. But the lattice correspondence between FCC and body center tetragonal representation of austenite is such that all the octahedral voids are on only one of the three sub lattices. And after vein strain, therefore, what happens is all the carbon atoms that are present end up on only one of the three sub lattices of this structure, resulting in a tetragonal structure. So, when displacive ferrite first form, it is necessarily tetragonal. But afterwards, if the temperature is high enough, it can redistribute itself. So there is a temperature called Zener ordering temperature. If the transformation is above that temperature, then carbon atoms can jump around and uh, and the crystal structure will be body centered cubic. But if the temperature is less than the this inner ordering temperature, then the transformation will continue to remain tetragonal. And there are several models which estimate this critical temperature across which this order to disorder transformation would take place. According to the original estimates of Zener, at room temperature, if the carbon content is more than 0.64, martensite would be tetragonal. But if it is less than that, if carbon content is less than 0.6, martensite is expected to be cubic and there are several estimates the, and the more recent estimates suggest that if the carbon content is more than 0.2 at room temperature we expect to have body center tetragonal structure whereas, uh, whereas if the carbon content is less than that we will we will have a cubic structure there are there are models which simply calculate which show that when 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 car, which calculate the free energy and one can see that if the carbon is high there is an advantage in terms of free energy when the struggle structure is formed and very decent cal first uh, first principle calculations also say that as the carbon atoms order on one of the sub lattices it, it it is favored by enthalpy change so enthalpy change is favorable when carbon atoms order on one of the three sub lattices. So the, this collates a lot of experimental evidence which shows according to this uh, carbon and nitrogen, these, these are data for carbon and nitrogen, both kinds of interstitial atom. It shows that C by A ratio increases in direct proportion to the atom percent of carbon and nitrogen atom as long as the concentration of is more than a critical value and if the concentration is less than the critical value c by a ratio remains one now what is that critical value traditional literature suggests that the critical value for carbon is 0.6 these two points if you note these the, the two points that have marked with a red are both referred to nitrogen atom so really speaking the experimental data for carbon for uh, for having body centered cubic structure at room temperature exist only up to 0.2% carbon. These the, the other two data at higher concentrations are for 
nitrogen atom. What is even more interesting is that carbon and nitrogen both follow the same trend, same straight line or same equation of C by A ratio given below holds for carbon and nitrogen atoms both, even though nitrogen at atom is slightly smaller than carbon atom. So that itself is an interesting aspect. Also, in some literature, people say that this C by A ratio applies when about 80% of carbon atoms order on one of the sublattices, which refer which which corresponds to a Zener order parameter of about 0.7. Also, originally it was believed that C by A ratio of martensite is independent of the concentration of substitutional alloying elements. So let us examine this because there are some very interesting results and at least I don't understand or I don't have a, a, a self-consistent theory to, to explain why such behaviors uh, behavior is observed. So if we look at the effect of alloying element, these are results from iron carbon manganese alloys. Freshly formed martensite, the C by A ratio is less than the ideal value that I just showed. And then when it is heated up, to room temperature, C by A ratio increases, which is uh, what, according to what I have discussed, it should be the other way around. But then there are several explanations which have been put forward, and none of them, as I said, appear to be satisfactory. Some argue that carbon atoms, maybe some carbon atoms occupy the tetrahedral sites. There is another theory which says that transformation does not take place. Transformation to alpha prime martensite does not take place direct, directly goes through an intermediate stage of uh, epsilon martensite formation. And originally, origin in the original paper of Kurjumov, what they argue is that the lattice invariant deformation for martensite transformation involves shearing on 100 as well as 112 planes, and which is somehow, it's a very complex set of uh, argument that they put forward, not very convincing because it has been criticized by Christ Christian afterwards. And they argue that when that happens, the C by A ratio is less than the ideal value, but upon heating to higher temperature, C by A ratio recovers, but it never reaches the ideal value given by that equation, which I showed earlier. If we look at aluminum, nick, uh, iron, nickel alloys, it shows a reverse trend where C by A ratio is more than the ideal value. And then upon heating, it tends towards the ideal value. And they here, the explanation is straightforward. They argue that in this alloy system, because that ideal value corresponds to, as I said, ideal value corresponds to a situation where 80% of the carbon atoms are, are on one of the three sub lattices. Whereas in this case, it ap apparently more than 80% or all the carbon atoms are, 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 are ordered. Therefore, the C by A ratio is higher than the ideal value. So, so, so th th there are many such interesting results in literature. If you want, if one wants, one can explore. But these two I found very interesting, and therefore I uh, am highlighting it here. What, what are these? There are two sets of results here, even though they are not given in detail here. One result is that strain-induced martensite. When we deform austenite, we all know it uh, trips and martensite is formed. Irrespective of the carbon concentration of austenite, which is transforming, strain-induced martensite is body-centered cubic. Not only that, even if to begin with martensite is body centered tetragonal in high carbon steels, upon when martensite is deformed, the crystal structure changes from body centered cubic, uh, body centered tetragonal to body centered cubic. So I found it very interesting, but it needs uh, further explore, exploration. So, 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 so to summarize, therefore, I think I will go by this, which shows that C by A ratio is more than one when carbon concentration in alloys is more than 0.2 at room temperature, of course. If, if, if the carbon concentration at room temperature is less than 0.2, the crystal structure of displacing product or displacing ferrite should be cubic, and this fits in very well with the results that I will show subsequently. And there is another interesting feature, which is that when carbon atoms are ordered, then it undergoes uh, what is known as conditional spinodal decomposition at low temperatures or below the spinodal line, resulting in the formation of carbon depleted and carbon rich regions only when carbon atoms are, uh, are, are, are ordered. If, if the carbon atoms are disordered, there is no miscibility gap in iron carbon diagram. And people have calculated a miscibility gap in iron carbon martensite. These are in binary iron carbon alloys. 
of course one can uh, if, if there are other alloying elements present these uh, phase boundaries would change and there are um, experimental results which show that the segregation of uh, of martensite into carbon rich and carbon lean regions so 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 with this background in mind we started studying the transformations in bainite and as we all know dilutometer is a very powerful technique because we can detect the transformation as it happens and we can use it uh, we usually use it to construct cct diagram or to detect the transformation start and finish temperatures but we we could do a much more quantitative analysis using this and it's very simple so this is one curve heating curve that is schematically shown here as one heats the the change in length is is a directly proportional to the fraction of the phases and their lattice parameters the lattice parameter in turn would depend on the temperature and thermal expansion coefficient of the phase it will depend on the presence of other alloying elements and at of course at any point the sum total of all the phases and the mass balance must hold so 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 to simplify length change is proportional to the fraction of phases the composition of phases the lattice parameter of unalloyed material uh, thermal expansion coefficient and temperature etc so we can do an iterative process or we have developed an iterative process where this is calculated starting from some guess values and when when we get a very good match between the experimental dilatation curve and the calculated ones we get the the fraction of the phases and the composition at least in terms of carbon concentration assuming as assuming para equilibrium transformation and the thermal expansion coefficient and therefore we use this to understand some more details of the of the transformation we begin with martensite transformation because martensite in a sense is easier because the parent phase and the product phase phase have the same composition therefore there is one less variable to deal with so i will show you some results so here we just take an ROIC having about 0.2% carbon and we cool it very rapidly to get martensite there are two variants of the alloys one is an aluminum rich alloy another one another one is a silicon rich alloy and then we ran this procedure what we found is normally c by e ratio is mart of martensite is represented as a function of carbon concentration only the effect of other substitutional alloying elements is not available in literature so when we use that we saw that the fit between the experimental dilatation curve and the calculated ones is not very good but if we include the effect of substitutional alloying elements and keeping the c by e ratio fixed which what we are saying is we said that c by e ratio is does not depend on the concentration of substitutional alloying elements it depends only on the con carbon concentration and when we did that we got a very good fit between the experimental and the calculated dilatation curve and we use this to calculate the volume fraction of martensite at any temperature between ms and the so called mf temperature which which is where maybe most of austenite transforms to martensite and and then of course we did some more analysis of how what is the effect of different alloying elements on the lattice parameter etc etc and how they fit to the the standard constinen and warburger type equation that are available and we found out that none of them represent the kinetics of martensite transformation very well and then the we 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 calculated the c by e ratio of martensite from the dilatometer analysis and compared those values with the ones that we calculated or that we estimated from x ray and they show a good match fitting fitting one of those equations which are available in literature so we move on to bainite transformation and we did uh, continuous cooling once again so we cooled one of those alloys at at an intermediate rate to obtain bainitic microstructure and then we tried to fit the experimental dilatation curve to the calculated ones assuming assuming body centered cubic structure of ben bainitic ferrite having very negligible amount of carbon the fit was not good and it gave gave some ridiculous results in terms of carbon concentrations of austenite so so obviously this is not the situation that happens so when we assume that body uh, bainitic ferrite is body centered cubic having carbon concentration which uh, which 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 the equations calculate the fit improved but the best fit was obtained when the calculations were repeated assuming body center tetragonal structure for bainitic ferrite and carbon concentration was calculated so we believe therefore that the 
bainite that forms at least in these alloys at such temperature has a tetragonal structure. And the carbon concentration that we obtained from this analysis is about 0.18, which matches very well with the uh, with the X-ray results. We did some more analysis in last one year or so. As we know, when bainite forms, it has certain amount of retained austenite in film form as well as uh, in bulk form. So, the, so austenite, the austenite that is untransformed after bainite magnetic transformation, uh, they, they appear as film austenite or or, or, or bulky, bulky austenite, and it is known that the carbon concentration of these two morphological variants differ. And qualitatively, it is known that film austenite has higher carbon than 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 than, than bulk austenite or blocky austenite. We, we 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 separated out and we repeated our analysis, breaking the carbon concentration of the two morphological variants. And what we what we figured out is that the films of austenite have twice as much carbon as the blocky austenite. We have done some more detailed analysis in recent months where atom probe analysis has confirmed our results that film austenite has twice as much carbon as the blocky retained austenite after bainite transformation. So what is the validity of our model, model for analysis of dilatation curves? When we are studying martensite or bainite transformation, of course, we cannot confirm it directly from microstructure because distinguishing these phases from the microstructure is extremely difficult. Therefore, to test our method, what we did is we took on one of the alloys, transformed it between A1 and A3 temperature to allow some amount of ferrite to form. As you can see, during uh, it transforms to ferrite first, austenite transforms to ferrite first, and then the untransformed uh, austenite transforms to martensite later on. Okay, and the mic from microstructure, one can clearly see, call clearly, quantitatively estimate the relative fraction of ferrite that forms during intercritical holding of the samples. And when we compared these results, where when we compared the, the the ferrite fraction as estimated from optical microstructure with the ferrite fraction calculated from the dilatation curve, we saw a good match. And the MS temperature also that we predicted also showed a good match. Therefore, we know we are confident of, of the method that we are using. OK, so 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 the, the, the conclusion from this part is that the that the crystal structure of venetic ferrite could be BCT under certain circumstances, which is what I will elaborate. Carbon con carbon concentration of this venetic ferrite can be higher than what is usually believed. And then some more analysis. Uh, uh, analysis gives us the result that film austenite has twice as much carbon as the blocky austenite. So we continued with similar work we, uh, to study isothermal transformation of bainite. We obviously to, uh, we, we took one of those alloys, transformed it. The green line. I will uh, I will ask you to focus on the green line. It is simply an austenitic treatment where after austenitization we transform the material to bainite. So start. The initial carbon content of austenite was about 0.2. That is what we call BT treatment, direct benite treatment. Now, if you focus on the red lines, what we did is we gave an intercritical treatment to obtain about 50% ferrite so that the austenite remaining untransformed at that point would have about 0.4 weight percent carbon, and which is what went underwent benitic transformation at similar temperatures. So, so two, 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 two. Two bainite transformations: one uh, austen, uh, one austenite containing 0.28% carbon. In another case, austenite partially transformed to ferrite, enriching the carbon of austenite, and then this carbon enriched austenite undergoing bainitic transformation. This is what we did, and did a detailed analysis of the dilatation curve, with the microstructure, uh, 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 etc. So obviously, in one case we have only bainite martensite, in another case we have ferrite, bainite, and martensite. Some more detail. Analysis was done to confirm that uh, benetic ferrite is more or less carbide free and some hardness studies and amount of retain of nitrous were, were, were estimated as usual using X-ray methods. What is what is interesting is that when austenite is directly transformed to bainite without any intermediate ferrite transformation, which means that the parent austenite, which is undergoing bainite, bainite transformation, has only 0.2 carbon. The ferrite, benetic ferrite, contains very small amount of carbon, and the austenite, which is left untransformed, more or less follows the T0 line, which is what we all know. 
that 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 a, a benite shows incomplete transformation and when the transformation stops the the carbon content of austenite follows the t0 line where t0 being the being the composition or the temperature at which austenite and ferrite of the same composition have the same free energy so that is straightforward that is what uh, is known but when we repeated this similar test after partially transforming austenite to to ferrite so that austenite which undergoes benite transformation had 0.4 or double the carbon content we got very interesting results what are the interesting results we found out that benitic ferrite has much higher carbon of about 0.2 in general also the carbon content of austenite at which the transformation stops is higher than the t0 line so t0 also apparently shifts towards higher carbon concentration and benitic ferrite of course also has higher carbon content so that was interesting of course there are similar results available in literature and some of them are listed here uh, they all they both of these have shown that carbon content of austenite is more than t0 and the, the, they also somehow some of these works they also somehow by mass valence they estimated that carbon content of benitic ferrite has to be about 0.2 to be consistent with the results that they had but then they discarded this result they said no this is impossible how can benitic ferrite have such a high amount of carbon and they tried to explain their results by arguing that carbon is not homogeneously distributed and it is the heterogeneous distribution of carbon which is responsible for the results that they see but there is an and uh, but then but then there are very many results which are listed here I every mean, peruloma has has reviewed all these results and that show that under certain conditions benitic ferrite has higher carbon than is expected from equilibrium between body centered cubic ferrite and austenite and these these carbon atoms are, do not i mean even after tempering they persist in the structure so initially in the early days of the research it was believed that these carbons are the ones which are segregated at defects but afterwards when very high resolution measurements using atom probe were done it was found out that even in those areas away from the regions of segregation the amount of carbon that remains in solution in ferrite is higher than expected from bcc fcc equilibrium in fact we did the similar work long ago in 2008 where just by microscopical microstructure analysis we come to the conclusion came to the conclusion that benitic ferrite has about 0.3 or higher carbon so so what is the reason so 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 we came across this where jang and harry vadishya they did a dft based calculation to show that the free energy of solution on, of carbon in body centered tetragonal ferrite is about 1000 joules per mole less than the free energy of solution of carbon in body centered cubic structure right and with this value they re recalculated the phase boundaries between ferrite and austenite and they showed that body centered tetragonal ferrite has a higher solubility of carbon than expected from equilibrium of bcc and fcc ferrite so so this this line the blue dashed line shifts rightwards indicating higher solubility of carbon uh, in body center tetragonal ferrite so 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 starting from this we argue that normally when we consider we consider an equilibrium between body centered cubic structure and face centered cubic austenite resulting in uh, the common common tangents gives us the solubility of carbon in ferrite and austenite respectively and the t0 line is the line where the two curves cross over but if ferrite has a body centered tetragonal structure the enthalpy of solution of carbon in tetragonal structure is different then the same thermodynamic description should not apply it should have a different thermodynamic description and, and at higher carbon concentrations the body center tetragonal structure should have a lower free energy and of course if the carbon concentration is less body centered cubic structure will be favorable and then if we now run a, 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 a do a common tangent construction in one shot it shows that the carbon solubility in body center tetragonal ferrite will be higher and at the same time t0 line will also shift towards right or carbon 
when the penetic transformation stops, the carbon content of austenite that, remain, uh, uh, that remains untransformed will be higher than T0, or we will have a new T0 uh, as defined by equilibrium between body center tetragonal and face centered cubic structure. So, and then we from our uh, experimental results that I showed, where we showed the shift in the solubility of carbon in ferrite as well as T0. We back calculated the free energy difference between cubic and tetragonal ferrite. The three red points are from our calculations. That is the difference in the free energy between cubic and tetragonal ferrite. The blue point is the Jang and Madesia's work based on DFT calculations. So, so, so the, the, it kind of shows a trend. Of course, there are some other, as I said, that when magnetic ferrite is tetragonal, there is a possibility that it will undergo a spin order decomposition. Or if carbon atoms are ordered on, 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 on one of the three sublattices, then it shows a visibility gap. But the two experiments shown by the red dots here are at such temperatures, one when the carbon content of austenite was low, the transformation temperature was above Zener hardening temperature. Therefore, we obtained a cubic structure. When the trans, when the carbon content of parent austenite was higher, about 0.4, the transformation to bainite took place at a lower temperature below the Zener hardening temperature. Therefore, we obtained a tetragonal benetic ferrite having a higher carbon. I did a couple of experiments to see whether we can enrich the austenite enough so that at the temperatures at which bainite form, we can land into the region where phase separation will take place. But uh, I, the two experiments that I have done, I am yet not in the region where I will have carbon rich and carbon depleted regions, but we will explore further. The problem is all these phase boundaries are not uh, really known. So we have, we are shooting in the dark and doing experiments one by one to see whether in the same alloy, we show separation, phase separation of, of, of ferrite into carbon rich and carbon lean regions. So the conclusion from this part of the work is that benetic ferrite is body centered tetragonal and its solubility is higher. Sometimes people use the term that it is super saturated with carbon, but if the solubility changes, super saturated may not be the right term. What we are saying is solubility itself increases. And that has implications. What is the implication of this? So normally we know that there are trip aided steels and there is quenching and partitioning variant of trip aided steel. So it has a very simple heat treatment that we do intergenetical treatment followed by followed by os tempering and then then we get some amount of retained austenite having higher carbon which undergoes the trip effect giving very good ductility to, to the material. So we can have a very simple model to predict the optimum conditions at which the amount of retained austenite is maximum. This is very simple model which predicts that for a given set of uh, of thermal treatment, what will be the uh, what will be the amount of retained austenite and its carbon content. Obviously, all such calculations rely on accurate determination of phase boundaries. Now, if you are arguing that phase boundaries itself are shifting, then that would have an effect on the calculations, of, or, or that will have an effect on how we calculate and predict the optimum processing conditions. One example is shown here where, where, where we see that how the amount of or the amount of retained austenite as well as its carbon content changes if we allow the carbon content of ferrite to change or if we allow T0 line itself to shift towards higher carbon concentration. So this is very important to know it correctly. We give another example in terms of quenching and partitioning steel, which all as we all know that it is a very simple heat treatment. We take a, they take a to take a low alloy steel, austenitize it and quench it to a temperature between MS and so-called MF, hold it for a certain amount of time to allow austenite to partially transform to martensite having same carbon as the original as the original austenite. Then, then a partitioning step is given either at the, at the quenching temperature or at a higher temperature where excess carbon of martensite partitions into austenite unless until the chemical potential of carbon becomes equal in the two phase and then it is cooled. So then then finally cooling takes place where where austenite can further transform into fresh martensite if its carbon content is such that MS is above room temperature. 
If not, then the, the, the same amount of retained austenite will be will will be retained in the microstructure. So, so Spear has suggested a very simple model to obtain the optimum temperature at which the maximum amount of retained austenite can be obtained. And it has very simple assumptions that there are no competing reactions in the sense that there is no carbide formation and there are no there is no bainite. That interface remains immobile and entire martensite decarburizes completely, it loses its supersaturation completely. So if we run this model, what we found out that in one of the alloys, we, 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 we did this, that the amount of retained austenite and the fraction uh, and, and the carbon content of retained austenite as calculated from Spears model do not match with the experimental value. There is a big mismatch between the two. And as I as we all know, there are several equivalent Constantin and Warburger equations to describe the kinetics of martensite transformation. We tried and we found out that none of them can explain the amount of retained austenite in the final microstructures. Even the amount of carbon cannot be predicted well using one of any of the observed uh, any of the uh, of the models. So reasons are simple that indeed carbide precipitation takes place. In in fact, uh, in our case, the carbon content of the alloy was 0.2, and we saw that because of auto tempering, uh, a reasonably good amount of carbon formed even during quenching. <laughs> the as quench cells sample itself, there was some amount of carbide precipitation, and and this carbide, if you or if the partitioning is done at a higher temperature, these carbides, because they might be epsilon carbides or other metastable carbides, and during partitioning, they may undergo dissolution. So this is not accounted in, in the model. Of course, there could be during partitioning treatment bainite transformation. The model assumed that martensite completely decarburizes, but it may not be so. Martensite can continue to hold a certain amount of carbon, especially at dislocations and other defects. So the, 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 these are the simplifications in the model which result in a poor fit between the experimental data and, uh, and the calculated ones. And here indeed I show that these are just quenched samples and we see lots of carbide in the as quenched sample itself. And, and uh, we also have observed maybe this slide, is, that slide is not here, that during partitioning the carbide density goes down, signifying that uh, if the partitioning temperature is high enough, some of these carbides could indeed dissolve. So, so, so we tried to correct these predictions. What we did, this is a simple quenching and partitioning treatment that we did. And the MS temperature of the steel was about 330. And when one can see that that after partially transforming to martensite, the temp during during partitioning stage, a small amount of bainite does form. So, and and then. As I indicated earlier, also that none of the kinetics model, like Koestinger and Marburger, etc., they give very accurate estimate of the kinetics of martensite transformation between MS and the quenching temperature. Therefore, what we did is I fitted an equation like this and obtained for the alloy under consideration, obtained the coefficients value directly from the experimental results. And when these coefficients are used, and other, along with other corrections, we obtained a better fit. We also saw that for partitioning treatment at 400 degrees centigrade, for example, in our case, there is distinct evidence that a small amount of bainite forms. In fact, there are a lot more details that if you hold it for a longer time, there is a small contraction, which we believe might be due to carbide dissolution or precipitation. Of course, we don't have direct uh, uh, microstructural evidence for this, but there is a, repeatedly we have seen that after a long time holding, there is a small contraction which may be attributed to some fine changes that might be, might be taking place. What might be happening is during partitioning, uh, the dislocations that are generated during quenching dislocations will recover. Therefore, carbon atoms that are locked at those dislocations are now free to either go to austenite or they might precipitate depending on the temperature of partitioning. So, so the, there are lots of parallel reactions that go on and it is very difficult to model. But nevertheless, we tried, we analyzed, we, we make some corrections. What are those corrections? We, we analyzed the dilatation data and we fitted and fitted to, to a better model to describe the kinetics of martensite transformation. We incorporated carbide pre precipitation because in directly quenched sample also we saw a certain amount of carbide. We also said 
that if the partitioning temperature is above Zener ordering temperature, then Benedict ferrite will be cubic. If not, if it is less, then the Benedict ferrite will be tetragonal, having a carbon content of about 0.2. We allowed higher solubility of carbon inside martensite, especially because there are dislocations which do not fully recover and carbon would remain trapped at those dislocations. If we addressed some of these issues, we obtained a better fit between the fraction of retained austenite that is that we experimentally observed and that we calculate from a, what I would say a modified steer model. So I think I think that is all I have to share today. Of course, this work has been done by a number of PhD students and their contribution is acknowledged. I of course just happen to present it here. So thank you so much. If there are questions, comments, I'll be happy to address. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singh. And uh, yeah, any questions, please? Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, so, you know, uh, reactions like spinodal and so forth, uh, which is carbon inside the um, alpha, uh, they happen after the transformation event. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't. Uh, necessarily influence the free energy of uh, transformation. Yes, yes, definitely. They will happen only below the uh, miscibility gap. They, only when you are below the miscibility gap. In the single phase that we are talking about, yeah? Yes. Uh, the alpha phase. So the alpha phase has to form first. Yes. And then you might, you might get yeah. some sort of yeah. uh, spinodal yeah. or tempering effect. Yeah. So, so what I was trying is if we can, we can, we can have uh, enrich austenite to such an extent that bainite transformation is taking place within the spin order. So ferrite will form first, and then it will show phase separation. If that happens, it will be direct evidence that that benedict ferrite to begin with oh, was ordered or tetragonal. As a secondary reaction is what. Yeah, I'm as a secondary to... reaction. Yeah. So that will be an indirect evidence to show that ferrite, uh, benedict ferrite is indeed supersaturated. Is it not, Harry? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So, but then I have to have maybe slightly higher carbon in my alloys. With the alloy that I have, I have not been able to achieve this, but I will try a few more times. Let's see. I'm just uh, thinking that uh, with respect to the mechanism, it may not be relevant. So if it is, if it is showing that it is undergoing phase separation, and because but phase that separation... Would be, uh, that would be after transformation, right? Yes, yes. So no, but the phase separation takes place only when the carbon atoms are ordered, right? Uh, so first you have to create that, right? Yeah, yeah. So and that if the carbon from... atoms are or ordered, which means the transformation is displacing, right? So yes, so first you form that solution and yeah. then it undergoes spinodal yeah. or temporary. Yeah. yeah. So j j just curious from the uh, lectures, we have been taught for a long time that uh, martensite is BCT, but your talk says due to uh, some kind of transformation uh, uh, mechanisms, it may also be BCC, right? So. Anything to modify in our teachings? Uh, no, no, teachings, I mean, usually <laughs> okay. we don't consider, I mean, we, uh, if the carbon content of austenite from which martensite is forming is less than 0.2, the majority of okay. literature is, if it is less than 0.2, then to begin with, this is tetragonal, but then the carbon atoms can jump very quickly. It is very mobile, even at room temperature, it being a very small atom. So even if it is ordered on one of these sub lattices, it can redistribute itself and the crystal structure will become cubic. That is what we are saying. If the carbon content is more than 0.2 or so, then it will remain tetragonal. And I'm talking about room temperature. Of course, if you are sub-zero temperatures, then these values might change. I mean, a lot of deep understanding of mechanism point yeah. of view. Yeah. Very, so very originally it was believed that if the carbon content is less than 0.6, then it will be cubic, but that I, I believe that is because peak splitting of martensite peak does not happen as long as the uh, is not does not happen as long as the carbon content is 0.6 or less. So therefore, this therefore people would have believed that uh, martensite is cubic 
when the carbon at room temperature when the carbon content is less than 0.6 even in the in the Zinner's original paper in mid 40s his calculations showed that if the carbon content at room temperature is less than 0 0.6 then 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 the crystal structure would be cubic but he himself is saying that people have shown this at 0 0.2 or 0 0.4 hi thanks i has and uh, a really nice talk professor also uh, i have a, a quick question so uh, probably I, I don't have uh, such deep understanding as as what you present here about the um, finite phase transformation. So, but uh, uh, when we did some uh, CCT curves of steel with different impurities, and we see that the impurities suppress the formation of bainite. And uh, I'm wondering, from your perspective, how should we understand this phenomenon? Uh, what models or theories can 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 be applied to explain the suppression of bainite formation due to, for example, the addition of the impurities like copper, nickel, and uh, tin, etc. You mean, you mean uh, you what you are trying to say is if there are impurities, bainite transformation is suppressed? Yes, during the CCT, uh, in the CCT curves. Uh, no, I think what what happens is when there are when it's a plain carbon steel only, and if one is doing continuous cooling, we do not really get bainite because the cooling rate, the critical cooling rate to obtain bainite is such that if the cooling rate is less, we don't get bainite, and if the cooling rate is more, this sample spends very small amount of time in the bainitic region. Therefore, pra practically speaking, plain carbon steels do not show bainite. Or the, or the, or the, 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 in the, in the range in which bainite transformation takes place, the cooling rates are such that sample does not get to spend much time. And, and even in bainitic region, the transformation kinetics get slower as the temperature decreases. So, so, so effectively, there is no bainite transformation if it is a plain carbon steel. Oh, so the steel we are studying has 0 0.15 carbon and 0 0.8 five manganese so it's a low carbon steel yeah yeah, yeah. so so it should it, it, it the, the cooling rate for obtaining uh, i mean is the, either the cooling rate is so slow that we get ferrite perlite or cooling rate is so fast that we get martensite bainite requires an intermediate cooling rate and at such cooling rates the range of bainite transformation is maybe about 200 degrees centigrade and the sample will spend maybe a couple of seconds in that region in which time appreciable amount of bainite cannot form. So it completely bypasses the bainite transformation. Okay, okay. 